So, um, do you prefer me calling you the delegate here? No. Okay. I don't. No. I prefer you calling me Borg. <laughs> You're saying my house, eating my pie. Yes, all of that. <laughs> um, Hello everyone who lives in State District 20, Maryland, which means you likely live in White Oak, Silver Spring, or Tacoma Park. This video is for you, because we knocked your door, and you privately shared with us on a microphone what you wanted our representatives to work on. So here is the response back from one of your state representatives, Delegate Lorig Sharkudian. All right, so discriminatory policing, uh, one constituent mentioned yeah. that specific, but I hear this a lot. People yeah. talk about discriminatory yeah. policing. Maybe they don't talk about it on mic. Um, his specific quote, and I wanted to do that because I thought it sounded... Okay, he said, yeah, I just want to raise awareness. I don't believe that saying Black Lives Matter does not mean or equate to Blue Lives doesn't matter. I want to see the two communities when, in fact, they're an overall community... Uh, see the issue that Black Lives Matter is really about fair administration of law and order. Every citizen should be with that regardless of race. Um, you have extensive mediation mm -hmm. experience. How do you feel about what you said? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think that the Black Lives Matter movement has been a really crucial movement to raise broad awareness across the country of just how incredible the disparities are between how communities of color have been policed compared to communities mm. of white communities. And I think that that while people across the board of, of all races, but I think in particular probably white communities who haven't had to look at that, it's been harder it's been harder to face that and see that and accept that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, that unfortunately because we do tend to think of things as so like uh, with it's yeah, yeah yeah it's like so one way or the other um the pushback against that is like well if you're challenging the way that police are policing communities then you must be anti-police mm. um and while some people might be broadly anti-police whatever that means um I, I think what he's trying to say is that it is i think his point is that it's not anti-police to say we think there ought to be equity in the way that policing happens across all communities. I think that's what he's saying and yeah. I would agree with that statement. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, that, there's, that there's things that have to be done at multiple levels. There's policy-based solutions, that things that need to change. There's training that needs to change. There's accountability. There's, there's, a, there's a, how police are, are um, uh, evaluated. Um, how promotions happen, those kinds of things need to change. And then I think a piece of what he's talking about is some of the work that I've done in my other career, um, which is the um, sort of the dialogue and the opportunity for people to, to hear and understand each other, police yeah. and, and communities. And uh, the community mediation folks that I work with across the state have done a lot of work in dialogue between police and, and communities. And I'm actually hopeful that, um, that uh, now that uh, for a little while in Montgomery County, we've had we had an interim chief, and mm -hmm. we now have a, a chief. Uh, and I'm hoping that that in Montgomery County, those kinds of dialogue circles that we had been hoping would happen, you know, could could start to happen. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, there are still some a lot of structural issues that also need to change. In addition to the building understanding between police and community members. Um, and so one of the structural issues, and I'll just speak directly to the, the community where Mr. White was killed. Um, I think that um, Mr. White's death was tragic and unjust, and that community was traumatized and lost somebody they very much cared about. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm part of what, um, you know, I think that, that people are really affected by that and still struggling to figure yeah. out what to do with yeah. that. Um, I know that for me, when I was asking a lot of questions around that time, um, that was a little bit before I was elected, I think it was after the primary, but I was involved right. enough, I was asking a lot of questions, and part of what became clear was um, that Montgomery County, even with a decent amount of training in terms of mental health, response to mental health, um, does not have a, a crisis intervention team policies, best practices implemented okay, as well as they could be. Yeah. Um, now, in this particular case, in Mr. White's case, there's a, even before you get to the question about someone who's agitated because of mental health, there is a question about uh, why he was stopped at all. And I think that's right. a, that's a, that goes even further back. And there are some um, other policies that have to be addressed in terms of, of profiling and stopping people. Mm -hmm. Well, 
and then once you get, and this is what I'm saying about multi layers of, yeah. of, of issues. Sometimes police are stopping somebody who they shouldn't have stopped. Sometimes people are responding to a call where somebody has a mental health crisis. Mm-hmm. And so what, one of the things that came, became clear to me in that understanding what happened and looking at the videos and talking to police and, um, is that there are best practices that are out yeah. there and, and Montgomery County, uh, as much as we pride ourselves in doing a decent job, mm-hmm. um, is not there. And so I started looking across the state and across the country, and I did have a bill last year that didn't pass. I'm bringing it back this year that creates a um, an office in the Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention to um, set standards for best practices for crisis intervention and broadly mental health interventions mm-hmm. um, by law enforcement. Um, and, uh, and then... Uh, provides technical assistance and training and accountability for departments across the state, Montgomery mm-hmm. County and all departments, yeah, yeah. Um, on implementing those best practices. Um, and that's really one small piece of it, but it did it did cut me just because to this yeah. point about there's multiple layers. Yeah. Um, but I just I, I share that because that came specifically out of really looking at if Montgomery County has crisis intervention teams, like yeah. what went wrong. Yeah. Um, in this yeah. uh, in this situation, why he wasn't dispatched dispatching yeah. somebody who had yeah. CIT training? Why what you know like all the things that um, and uh, and so um, so that's that's one piece of it. I think that there's um, broader issues around police discipline. I think there's issues around training. I think there's um, uh, you know disparities in just in how you who gets stopped and mm-hmm. you know need to address mm-hmm. those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like there was something else. Sorry, that was gonna mention on this one. Oh, and and then I do think also whenever we talk about police involvement with mental health, I think yeah. that's always going to happen because when people feel scared, if they're watching someone in crisis and they feel scared, mm-hmm. as much as we want them to call yeah. a mental health service, often they will call the police. So we have to get that part right. We also just have to generally do more work on, on funding and addressing community mental health so that yeah. folks are less likely to get to the point that someone's calling the police yeah. about... about um, an encounter with a about setting up an encounter mm-hmm. with someone who has a mental health mm-hmm. issue and police officer. And I need to fact check this, but I heard from some people in in Silver Spring that, uh, and this was actually at a meeting, so it wasn't me knocking the door, but they had put out the statistic, and I was pretty surprised here. They said that there's only like two team members or something on the crisis intervention thing, and like one takes them like an average of two hours to get somewhere or something like that. I need to check that, that's, and I will, but... I'll tell you what I think that is. I don't know exactly what the... But I think that's the um, that's the mobile crisis unit. The mobile crisis unit. That's that. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So we have one mobile crisis unit. And that would be the responder, right? If you're... Yes. Yeah, so, well, the... So the mobile crisis unit is social workers who work for the Department of the Health, uh, I don't know what it is in Montgomery County. It's also DHHS or something. Yeah, something like that. Um, and so, yes, I, so ideally, right, what happens is when someone's having a mental health, health crisis, you want that yeah. that body to respond, to respond as opposed well. to police. Um, and, and yes, yeah, so that it could take two hours and if they're on a call dealing with something, they can't come. So that, yeah. And so that's to my other point about this need to, that's it. so obviously if you're waiting three hours and you and know, you're, like you're, your husband or son or mother is having a crisis and you're afraid for their safety or your safety yeah. and you can't get the mental, the mobile crisis, you need know, people call the police. And so then, you know, and that's where things get worse and, mm-hmm. Um, and so the need to both improve police response and to fully invest in the community mental health and the mental health responses so that you just are keeping people from entering into the criminal justice system or from getting killed mm-hmm. um, because of the escalation that often happens in an interaction with a police officer. There was a constituent who said that uh, she was like, she was like, I believe crime is decreasing in the area. I'm not sure, but um, I want it to fall further. And... That is, is like a broad thing to say, and there was, so I was just like looking yeah. at crime statistics after that. I heard another constituent um, who had, uh, we had knocked their door, they didn't record their voice, but they said that they had a motorcycle left on in their in their backyard for two days, yeah. and that it took the police the two days to get there, and it was just left on, so she was like, I'm just going to call the police, get it removed. Um, and then when it was she, left on? It was, it was left on. Running yes, in her yes, backyard. it was running in her backyard. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, she called and it took them a while to get there. Once they got there, like a day later or overnight, um, they picked it up and then she had followed up and was like, hey, I want to get some information on this. And then they hadn't uh, given her information on the investigation. But beyond that, though, she was just like, I feel like crime has actually either gotten more visible or, or worse in our area in the uh, like Burnt Mills, White Oak area, three okay. Oaks, not okay. three Oaks, five, Oak Leaf Drive. Um, 
And she was like, but the police station got here in 2014. The there, right? the... Yeah, so I, I'm interested. Did you take a look at the crime stats? I did, uh, but yeah. I need to take a really full look at them. So I have my friend who's volunteering to do research with Everyday mm -hmm. Canvassing to, to like do the statistical analysis on it because it was a lot. Um, and it was hard. They had a beautiful visualization on yeah. the Montgomery County crime map there. It goes to 2015 and then to 2019. Um, and I couldn't just, I'd have to count many dots and click them oh, to no, figure they it out. They, they have, really be... do. They have a table, but then you have to, like, if you want to split it up nicely. If they don't have just, like, a line graph, I feel like I've seen that, but I didn't maybe look they did, and I wasn't able to, maybe I didn't visualize it well. Yeah, so it's probably in the same place, because yeah. this is, they use the same open data and technology, and probably the consultants who built it, or whoever, is the same as, it looked very similar to the bus data, and the transit data, and the collision data that I was looking at for this. So I'm sure it's there, um, but to, like, figure out like maybe possession then maybe there are more arrests for possession than we thought still um that kind of data would be really cool to figure out and so over the next podcast we'll have that breakdown because yeah. actually in the, the apartments we're in now um behind sears um our crime is definitely the top issue that people are talking about okay oh, that, oh that's the one you're working on now that's the next one that we're yeah. working on and uh canvassing that neighborhood i mean there's probably Three percent of your entire district is right there because there's thousands. Behind Sears, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. No, there's a lot of a lot yeah. of them, and they're all unsecured apartments. So hey, for your next canvassing, no, but um, but going there. Oh no, I know the area well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're um, yeah, because they're like the kinds you walk up. In that's the, right. Yes, it's mm -hmm. easy for the winter on my volunteers because it's it's warm. Um, so we've been hiring a lot of people. <laughs> I and remember doing those in the winter. It's, it's great. It's that. great. It's fantastic. Um, uh -huh. But crime is definitely going to come up again, and so the statistics will become really relevant there yeah. and differentiated by because people are talking about people smoking in the area, and then people are talking about doing that in the laundry room. So people aren't doing their laundry at night because they don't know who these strangers are smoking in the yeah. laundry room. Yeah. Um, but then people are talking about violence and break-ins. And back to this podcast, though. There was somebody who was just like, I'm not sure if crime's going down, but I wanted to keep following. And then somebody else was like, police investigation, I don't know if I can follow up on it. I didn't get a good response back. I yeah. didn't get any response back when I wanted to know and it took a while for them to get rid of the bike. And then on top of that, she was also like, it seems like things have gotten worse in the area. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. I think that... Um so one thing that's interesting about crime statistics that I just know, I don't know why I know this, but I'm fairly certain this is accurate, is that most people don't actually have a good sense of whether crime's going up and down. People, people often think one thing or another based on just their yeah. circles, what's being, you know, what's on the news, mm -hmm, how they get their mm -hmm, information, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's not always tied to the, the, the data. So it's worth knowing what the data is just because it's worth knowing what the data is. I know, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't change if somebody feels unsafe. I mean, and that, that's the other issue is like there's the question about like is crime going down? Are we objectively getting better at safety? Um, and then the other question is do people feel safe in their neighborhood? And people need yeah. to feel safe in their neighborhood. So that's, that's like a separate question that may mm -hmm. or may not be related to what the trend is. Yeah. You know? um, and, uh, and, you know, I think often the interventions... Uh, and it's like the the community led interventions um, tend to be most effective. You know when it's really? like, well, there's yeah. kids hanging out in the laundry room. Well, we could call the police every single time we see them. Yes, um, that has its own set of of complications and problems and yeah. questions about, yeah. um, you know, the police state and the, what are we doing? And, and who are those kids? And they're somebody's kids and they're, you know, like what is going on? You know, like what does that do to That's somebody's baby. the community? Yeah. And, you know, like, do we set them on a path towards incarceration that may not be, uh, reflective of, of uh, what we want for the people in our community mm -hmm. and at the same time I need to go do my laundry and I don't feel safe and so like how do we how do we manage those pieces and I think that there's not easy answers but I do think that community led um, efforts that communities kind of come together get to know each other have conversations about mm -hmm. responses mm -hmm. Um, develop together how they want to keep their laundry room safe for everybody yeah. to go do their laundry I think yeah. You know, and that's not an an easy thing to do, and it's not something that can yeah. clearly do as a a state or a county. Um, but that's what I've seen over time be most effective. Be most effective, yeah. 
Um, so, well, you know, I'll be interested in hearing some of the specifics from the folks who were, who were, um, I, yeah, no, it sounds like we will and, and thinking about, and if people have ideas about, um, uh, you know, where there are state level policy, um, policies that we might, um, address them yeah or even county level and i would say you know in terms of um feel free to i don't know if you do this or not uh mm. but giving out my my email address my um my I state address that. like with the person who had the motorcycle in their lawn for example yes um something that i would do on that is just i would send another email to the, the district commander and say like hey this is my constituent and she has waiting on an answer for yeah. this can you please provide us with one yeah. um, and it shouldn't take that but sometimes it does and i'm happy to do that so I see if that's thing. still an open question i don't know if she got an answer or not but totally i think it was a couple years ago that it happened yeah but um, but on that kind of a thing um fit f folks <laughs> whoever's yeah, watching yeah. this um you know people can feel free to to shoot me an email directly and it's uh it's the kind of thing that especially if um uh if it's something like you're waiting on an answer from a or you need a police officer to come to the community meeting or you need it whatever where i can shoot an email to a, the district commander yeah. and maybe get an answer where mm -hmm. uh folks have been you know S similar to the streetlights, when we find out more about what's going on oh, no, with streetlights, yeah. I'm happy to, to send an email, I see. you know, yeah. following up. You ever done that with an apartment manager? You know, yeah. This, no, is, people... this is a... Well, so this gets to, you know, back to where we started about about uh, affordable housing and when it's affordable because... Yes. Uh, because maybe it's not taken care yes. of as, as well as it should. And then the county, um, you know, recently did pass... Um, a number of it was after tragically it's I think it it came after the explosion um, at Flower Branch Apartments which is okay. another issue that I've been working on just sort of side note with mm -hmm. Washington Gas's accountability on that explosion but um, but K management who manages Flower Branch Apartments and some of the other apartments in that area um, had been um, had has some accountability for uh, the situation there and responsiveness to people saying they smelled gas and the door mm -hmm. was locked and the first responders couldn't get into the door that was locked. Key management hadn't done what they were supposed to do with the key. So there was some issues specific to that. But the other thing that came out when that explosion happened and seven people died and several, ten, uh, 30 people ended up in the hospital. Yeah. Um, was the number of complaints that there had been and the number of violations within that facility. That just kind of go facility and stay on her. That just get, yeah. So, so it would be important. I mean, something you could provide to folks is the, um, there is a, you know, the, the county's Department of Housing and there's a process for inspections and there's a process for, yeah. you know, I don't know, depending on what it is people are looking for apartment managers to do. Um, so to answer your question, I mean, I'm, willing to send an email to an apartment manager i think that probably has less influence than you know okay. they have to be accountable to the the county or the county yeah, yeah. um you could send a thing to tom hucker and tom hucker can be like all right fine so, no, yeah, no. yeah 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 no i mean people do send me emails about all kinds of things and then, then we connect them <laughs> that's an interesting one do you get that sometimes please send an email to my county representative no well you know and tom's pretty good himself so yes. I, yeah i usually don't have people telling me to talk to tom I bet, but, yeah, but sometimes the people come to me because they don't they know me they don't know him and then i'll, I'll make that connection and he'll He'll take it. No, huh? I'm just kidding. What's that? I would, just if they didn't know you, if they knew you but didn't know him, so they like, I'm afraid of Tom. Yeah. <laughs> no, like sending him. Yeah. Okay. I wonder, is there, is this always a legal thing when people complain about an issue and then like, it's like, this isn't in my contract or there's something not in the contract about safety conditions or rats or cockroaches, I don't know, um, laundry stuff. Is that, does it always come down to a fight or sometimes does it not and it just comes down to an inspection the county does that or and that's the end of it they have to fix it or does it often go beyond that and people have to like dispute something legally so um i can rephrase i am not a housing attorney let me just be clear i'm okay. making legal advice i believe yeah. that people have the <laughs> okay. ability to go to housing court to get things enforced i don't want to give any advice for that yeah. but i think that the count whatever is in the county code 
got to be. So it is required by the county. Okay. The county has the ability to enforce. to enforce. So inspector it. comes out, they look, you haven't met the code. They can hold the, the property manager, the owner, accountable. Mm -hmm. um, require things to be fixed. Mm -hmm. Potentially mm -hmm. there's financial fines and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what I don't know, and someone should talk to a, a, an attorney, is if you can <laughs> simultaneously like file in court and have, you know, have... You know, if it's a violation of a lease. I mean, presumably, if it's if there's a violation of a lease, that's a legal document. So I assume you could theoretically go to court. Yeah. But I don't. I don't want to give I'll legal give advice. I'll give people your card and I'll say, <laughs> Lord Charcutian, She's not a, an attorney. Not an attorney. Okay, you wanted to end on your MGA note. Oh, oh yeah. So for folks don't know the General Assembly the session starts. So a lot of people, to your point, like don't necessarily know kind of what our work looks like, and so we have a ninety day session where we consider. Th 3,000 bills, somewhere between 2,500 Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, okay. It's intense. But, uh, but here's what I will say about it. Because of that, mm -hmm. and we all have, you know, one staff person. Mm -hmm. They're part-time, off-session, full-time, during session. It's a, it's a ton of work. And it is, and so what I like to stress for constituents is how important their involvement is. I think people think a lot about um, the federal government. You know, that's, that's what we kind of see more in the news, but um, people aren't always thinking about how much actually does get affected by state government policies. Yeah, and states um, can guarantee rights. Huh? States can guarantee rights. Yes, and and people need to come and ask for what they want. So I'm thrilled to have this podcast. I also want um, mm. uh, would encourage people to uh, you know if they, if people were willing to get on my email list, um, I do send weekly updates of like what's happening in session, weekly. what's going on. Right. It's at the beginning of the session, it's weekly, and then maybe it's like more like a week and a half. I was just, just <laughs> comparing the other week, updates I get from other legislators. Like, weekly is impressive. Just, just during session. Not just like people session. don't necessarily okay. want to hear from me weekly off session. I but see. during session, just because things I are mean, moving so <laughs> fast. Thank you. My Facebook is for that. Um, but, so, um, but, uh, so, but I also would encourage people to uh, just come to Annapolis. We do, so District 20. We do a District 20 night, and maybe you could like let folks you know that you're connecting to. So we do District oh, 20 yeah, night, yeah. and I've arranged. Last year we arranged transportation, so some people drive, but then we yeah. also arranged like last year we did pickups in we carpools and stuff. Uh, we actually paid for vans to pick Incredible. people up. We wow, had people beautiful. up in White Oak. It's a pickup in White Oak in Four Corners and in Tacoma Park, I think is where we ended up doing it. You guys had and a grant uh, for that or you guys pulled your money? No, we paid for it. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We feed people too. Okay. But, you know, so come to Annapolis. And I think one of the things that I want people to see is just kind of how... Except, like, you should know where laws are getting made that affect your life and say, come and take a look. And then people will come, they'll have dinner, we'll talk. And then um, usually we do it on a Monday night, and Mondays, Monday nights we have session at night, so people can then watch from the gallery and see like the session taking place. Yeah. And um, so that also any other time, if people want, can get themselves to Annapolis during session. My uh, office, is, you know, come say hi. And yeah. I have snacks. For everyone in my office, you do? coffee. Yeah. I do, I do. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, if people are interested in working on an issue they care about, it's like I think it's really important. I think it's um, I think that they're you know, as with any government body, paid lobbyists and corporate influence. It's just very easy. You know, people have folks there full time doing their lobbying for them, yeah. and, and residents can also show up and tell their reps what they care about, but mm -hmm. it's harder to do that. And so whenever I have a chance to encourage people to do that, I like to, I like yeah. to do that. Come, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And we can also, like I said, uh, like you said, actually, and asked, it's, it's easy for us to give information at the door and just be like, yeah, you can take this right to them if you have something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if, I'll give you some cards, actually. Yeah, when we leave. yes, Welcome please. Welcome to yeah. hand people my card. And, and again, like as we talked about, some of the things are like county issues or whatever. I mean, we'll not necessarily have a solution to everything, but mm -hmm. we'll direct. We won't. We won't leave people hanging. That's cool.